Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you for joining the first of the four part webinar series that we're bringing to you, legal implications surrounding COVID-19. Our first topic is positioning for what's beyond the horizon, what digital transformation and the data economy mean for you. My name is Juan Serrato and I'm a partner and co-leader of Baker Hostetler's new digital transformation and data economy team. We are a multidisciplinary team focused on helping clients determine where your opportunities and vulnerabilities lie and design a plan to manage, protect, and leverage digitization and data assets. Every, every Wednesday morning in May through the next four weeks, we'll be presenting a webinar highlighting how companies can position for what's beyond the horizon. Let me introduce you to um, our panelists, Janine Anthony Bowen, Chad Rakowski and I are co-leads of the Digital Transformation and Data Economy team at Baker Hosteller. I'm a partner in the San Francisco office and served as Chief Privacy Officer for Fannie Mae and Head Privacy Executive for LexisNexis, while both companies were going through major transformations. Janine is a partner in the Atlanta office. Janine's practice focuses on strategic commercial transactions with technology. Chad is a partner in the Philadelphia office Chad's practice focuses on the intersection of copyright and technology. Clients rely on him to identify their IP, to build internal processes for its management, navigate open source and other open innovation strategies, and to create licensing programs that enable full value realization. Richard Hsu is a managing director of the partner practice group in the San Francisco office of Major Lindsay in Africa. Prior to joining MLA, Richard was global head of the IP practice group at Sherman and Sterling, as well as co-chair with me of the privacy and data protection practice there. Allison Blair is principal at Corn Ferry, the world's largest organizational consulting firm where she specializes in executive recruiting. She places executives in roles ranging from vice president to board of directors with companies all over the US. And I think Ali wins the award today for having the most amazing backdrop in her office. <laughs> Our program today will last one hour and is approved for one hour of credit, CLE credit in California, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. Colorado and New Jersey credits are available via reciprocity. Credit is pending in Georgia, Ohio, and Washington State. For all other states, attorneys can receive a certificate of attendance and electronic materials so they can file directly with CLE credentialing entities. During the course of the webinar, you'll see two slides that will contain a CLE code. You'll need to make note of these two codes and enter them into a brief CLE questionnaire immediately following the program's conclusion. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can type your questions in the bar on the right, hand, right side of your screen in the questions area. We'll try to answer them as best as we can at the end of the program. If not, we'll follow up with you after the webinar to answer those questions. We have included our email addresses on this slide, so please feel free to contact us at any time with comments, suggestions, concerns, or questions. We'll also send an email to everyone uh, that has uh, registered um, in the next day or two with a link to the recording of the webinar and a PDF of the presentation. With that intro and administrative housekeeping aside, we are very, very happy that you have joined us uh, this morning and, and afternoon, and uh, we'll begin with the presentation. Next slide, please. Today, many of us are waking up to the news uh, that Airbnb is laying off 1,900 employees, which represents 25% of their workforce. The CEO, Brian Chesky, wrote in a letter to all employees that travel in this new world will look different, and we need to evolve Airbnb differently. Although it is painful to hear news like this, and I sit here in San Francisco, we're also hearing about many companies that cannot hire fast enough. So we've asked Ali and Richard, representing Corn Ferry and MLA, to discuss what hiring trends tell us about the post-COVID digital economy. What industries are hiring? And are companies in pivot, accelerate, or exit modes? Allie? Hello, so nice to be here. Um, I'm actually going to start this with asking you all a question to uh, get you thinking a little bit. Um, in uh, what organization do you think has the most public or popular recruiting process in the United States? Um, it's also probably the most expensive 
recruiting and vetting process. You're probably thinking Coca-Cola CEO or General Electric CEO, uh, but I bet you weren't thinking about the NFL, the National Football League. Imagine the National Football League. And uh, not to misrepresent myself, I'm not a football fanatic, but I do enjoy going to tailgate parties and <laughs> enjoying the environment. Um, but when I had the opportunity to, to watch the draft, um, I was really blown away. And of course, I asked a million questions about the process. Um, and so if we look at the the recruiting and vetting process, uh, these players are meeting with medical doctors, psychologists, the uh, the teams are meeting the families, the wives, and they are, you know, probably a psychic, I don't know. Um, but they're going through a very intense vetting process. Um, and for those of us that are not uh, football fanatics, um, the draft consists of um, 32 players in the first round of draft picks. Um, but then there's seven total rounds. So if you, you know, seven times 32 times the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're using during vetting has been, I mean, it's just phenomenal how large that is um, and how intense it is. And um, with COVID-19, they had to, to switch gears overnight. This was the first virtual um, draft uh, ever. So I think they did a phenomenal job and I think that they're a, um, a really good example of, you know, changing with the times. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how moving forward this is going to affect um, the NFL draft. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, who do you think or, or what is responsible for leading the most ever corporate and digital uh, transformations? Are you thinking uh, Boston Consulting Group, maybe McKinsey? Um, but the answer is actually COVID-19. This has pushed every organization into uh, their digital transformation. Um, and I can't—I didn't make that up. I saw it on a meme. It was next to the the um, the Tiger King memes all over. It's kind of been fun to watch all of this. But um, it—it's uh, been. I work mostly in the consumer space, so um, you know, seven months ago or seven weeks ago, we were watching Amazon and watching uh, Walmart buy to see you know who could get the best product the quickest to the consumer um, and then overnight they had to completely um, change their their distribution um, Amazon hired in 175,000 workers um, in a short amount of time they uh, the process for recruiting in for Walmart was all virtual um, they were having people show up the same day that they applied. So um, the process of vetting and interviewing was just condensed, you know, out of necessity. Um, it, it leads me to um, a, a gentleman that I know here in Atlanta, um, who he sells um, high-end beef, so your Wagyu's and all those amazing beefs to, and seafood to the high-end restaurants. So, you know, your Four Seasons, your Ritz Carlton's, um, but then overnight the mayor shut down the city. So he is sitting there with all of this inventory, very expensive inventory. So within days, he was able to reinvent his business um, bought, uh, bought trucks, hired drivers, hired a sales force that was able to revolutionize or to, to change his business into direct to consumer. So he took, I mean, no one knew that we would be sitting here right now in this, in this pandemic. Um, but he quickly responded and um, is doing very well right now. So post COVID, it'll be interesting to see, you know, when he brings back the, uh, the restaurant customers and then also this direct to consumer, I just, I can't wait to see what, what he does next. Um, on the other side of that, I also work with a um, multi-billion dollar not-for-profit organization, and um, we brought in a chief commercial officer. Um, this person was going to be charged with um, bringing all of the data together from all of the different organizations under this umbrella, um, rebrand the organization, look at e-commerce, um, just take this organization to the next level. Um, given this, they weren't prepared for this pandemic. Um, under their organization, they're needing to, uh, some of the, the businesses are going bankrupt. Some of them are being acquired by other companies. So instead of being able to be forwardly focused right now, they put that higher on hold until they, till they work all of this out. So um, I just wonder what it would have been like if they had brought this person in and, and, and what, what steps they could make during this pandemic. Um, so it's just kind of two different spectrums. Um, so, of course, I'm here to talk about hiring um, trends 
which it's, I look at it more as evolution. Um, you know, times are changing. It's not really a trend. We're here and it's going to continue to evolve. So we're still seeing digital roles, supply chain, um, the title of uh, chief data officer with all of the new regulations uh, surrounding data protection um, that will continue to, to be a, a really hot, um, a hot uh, role. To, to hire in. Um, I also was consulting yesterday with uh, a board of directors on diversifying their board and um, spoke to them about the importance of strategic data um, experience in the incoming board members. So, you know, it's been very digitally focused, but, you know, let's really talk about data and, and what you're going to be doing with it. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, this pandemic has um, really proven yet again or will prove that um, the fastest learning organizations and people who have the ability to reinvent themselves will be the ones that come out on top um, through this, this crisis. So about that, is there any questions? Sure, I have a question for you, Allie. Uh, what Recruiting process uh, has really kind of changed uh, during uh, the, the pandemic um, then that you think it's going to stay. Excellent question. Very good question. As soon as the board of directors were able to to turn on zoom and work on zoom, they were able to um, to feel more comfortable in the hiring process of not shaking a, a candidate's hand or sitting with them face to face. Um, I had a, a candidate offered a job last week as a CFO, a major corporation has not stepped foot in their head, the corporate headquarters. Everything was done virtual and Zoom. Um, so accepted an offer in the morning and then that afternoon was um, on FaceTime with a real estate agent shopping for homes. Had never, has, has been to the city before, but I mean, it is unheard of. I mean, I've been doing this over 20 years in recruiting and I would, I have not seen that. So we're seeing it at the front line as well as the boardroom and, and executive roles. So I think it's going to stay. I think now that the board sees that you can really, um, you know, understand people, like you can look at their background, you can see who they are, are they going to fit in your corporate culture. Um, I think it's been a really great thing that stays. Um, I think I, um, unless any other, I have one more question for you, Ali. <laughs> um, how about uh, kind of looking at, at the positives? I, I think it is, it is uh, you know, we definitely hear about uh, kind of difficulties and the challenges, but what, what positive do you think uh, we can look to in terms of uh, kind of the COVID-19 um, experience? That's a good, great question. Um, and with everybody moving you know the, the stay at home home orders and, and working from home um, companies are using are going to be using this to incentivize their employees um, because they're finding out that there's um that they're being very very productive at homes um i was on a call with a cfo last week who um, and i wrote these numbers down his his worldwide lease liability was over 300 million dollars so now having seen his teams work remote, um, they're gonna be able to augment schedules and um, do shared office space. Um, he anticipates um, the expenses to be reduced by 30%. So that's gonna be $90 million to his bottom line. So this historically office-driven organization, the CFO is completely behind moving to the, um, to saving money and letting people work from home. So I thought that was, a, it was not so good for the real estate uh, company, but good for my client. <laughs> yeah. That's a really interesting statistics. Uh, let's go to Richard. So Richard has a slightly uh, different uh, view in terms of hiring demands. Uh, Richard? Thanks, Yuan, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you noted, uh, you and I practiced together at, uh, at a former firm and uh, I can see that you're bringing the same amount of energy to your new firm as you did when we were working together. So it's great to be here and I really appreciate your inviting me. Um, let's see, so MLA is probably the largest national recruiting firm that, that focuses exclusively on hiring lawyers. Uh, we hire, you know, we work with partners at law firms and associates at law firms. We work with in-house, we work with temporary lawyers. So we certainly have a very good perspective on you know kind of market data if you will in all geographies across the country actually across the world so we sort of see a lot of different things um 
So right now, you know, probably with at no surprise, you know, lawyers uh, are not being hired at a very fast pace. You know, vir last year, virtually every law firm had their best year ever. Um, if you can see the papers and I'm sure you're seeing this, that's not happening this year. So clearly a lot of uh, law firms are putting hiring on hold, as you would expect. A lot of in-house searches are also being held. We have a number of retained searches. A lot of them are being on hold. Now, having said that, there are a few practice areas that um, still continue to be interesting or continue to get interest. And one of those areas is uh, data privacy and uh, security. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, with the COVID and the increased importance of technology now for being able to communicate, it's really no surprise that data privacy, data protection is going to be more important. So that is actually one of the areas where um, if you are a specialist in the area, law firms still are looking to fill those roles. In-house counsel are still filling roles. We see those roles being fulfilled along with a few others, but that's definitely one of them. So I think my informal advice to any parents out there is um, teach your kids to become data privacy and data protection lawyers. Um, the second trend, uh, which I'll comment a little bit on, is that now all lawyers are working from home, um, and that's both in-house and law firms. And I think two interesting trends are emerging from that phenomenon. One is that, you know, I think law firms are realizing, law firms and lawyers are realizing that remote working actually works pretty well. I mean, people are able to do and function, do all the things as lawyers and can work very well remotely. Um, so on one hand, I think some people, a lot of people are surprised by that because traditionally lawyers always are co-located. They feel like they need to work together. And I think they're realizing that, you know, actually you can work remotely. Um, on the other hand, it's also highlighting that there are certain things about the legal profession that really require in-person uh, in person contact. And in particular, I think the training of younger lawyers, this is another theme that I emerged with. I happen to work with a lot of partners who do a lot of training and they work with teams. And the legal profession is much more of a, an apprentice kind of business, really, honestly, apprentice kind of training. It's not really so much book learning. I mean, there is that, you go to law school for that. But in the actual training of junior lawyers, you really need that kind of hands-on. So on one level, while remote learning works, uh, remote working actually works very well, um, there's also another aspect, I think, about uh, working in teams that is hard to replicate completely remotely. Now, having said all that, I do believe that remote learning, even after uh, this pandemic is over, will be more um, more accepted and will be you know more embraced. And I do think that law firms, companies that are more flexible and willing to have lawyers work remotely will have some hiring and competitive edge in terms of recruiting because they will obviously be able to retain talent better. They can hire people that don't necessarily want to live in the geographies of their offices or cannot live so or need to commute further. So I do think um, there is that. I also think that um, the, the leadership skills that lawyers will have to have will change because leading the lawyers remotely, um, whether you're in law firm management or whether you're leading teams, you're a trial lawyer, I think will become more important. Um, the third trend that I see is that, um, and this I think goes exactly to the point of the seminar, which is being hosted by uh, Baker Hosteller today, which is the increase for the importance of data privacy. And of course, they're going to talk more about that. But in my limited world now, since I'm no longer practicing, um, I even see it because, for example, you know, companies that do not make that a first priority. So, for example, the well-known story about Zoom having insecure video or unsecure video and people being able to um, hack into them has caused a lot of companies, including law firms. And I know a lot of even in our business, you know, we're always concerned about client confidentiality. We work with extremely sensitive information our candidates and clients obviously you know who's moving i mean they're extremely paranoid about confidentiality and we're also extremely careful about you know using technology that is you know secure and and uh, and and secure so that's another trend that i see is i think the technology for providing those technologies uh, providing the remote workforce it, it being secure is becoming is going to become more important than ever so um, with that, I will turn it over to, I'm not sure I'm turning it over to, but Juwan or, um, not sure who's next. <laughs> I think we go uh, next to Janine uh, from okay. here. Thanks so much, okay. Richard. That was, that was Thank great. You. Thank you. All right. Um, so 
is that the code? So I suppose that's the code um, for uh, CLE for our, for our purposes. So um, to the extent that you are looking for credit, um, there's the code. So um, I think Juwan is, is rejoining us. I don't know, Juwan, if you had any questions for Richard. Um, if not, I will just go ahead on and uh, we'll keep moving. Okay, hearing none. Um, Will you advance to the next slide? Perfect. So I'll spend a little time talking about the pivot, and I've got two different perspectives for you here. Um, the first is what's going on from a hiring process to kind of build on what Allison and Richard shared. And secondly, turning attention a little bit to ways that companies are um, looking to offer more services to their customers um, in what may be untraditional ways for them. So companies are still needing to hire. And given this particular um, scenario that we find ourselves in, um, using technology to assist in the hiring process post-COVID is going to continue to be important. So we're beginning to see concerns reemerge around bias in technology, such as artificial intelligence, um, in the hiring, hiring environment. So we do expect companies to continue to adopt these technologies in order to assist in their ability to diligence candidates. And so many companies are going to continue the remote working trend in the near term and to the point of our previous panelists, um, maybe in different ways in the long term as well. Um, and so assessing quality candidates, using tools to mine applic um, applicant social media presences, um, and using things like AI to evaluate uh, video interviews are starting to get traction. And so that technology enhancement or disruption, depending on your perspective, of hiring practices has gotten the attention of legislators and the regulatory landscape around artificial intelligence for hiring um, is starting to uh, evolve. So there's a little bit of legislation that's already been enacted that we should be concerned about and several pieces of draft legislation that are on the table um, that companies just need to be aware of so they can design new hiring practices with some of these considerations in mind. Um, back in 2019, Illinois enacted the Illinois Artificial Intelligence Act where employers must get consent to record interviews that will use artificial intelligence and include disclosures about what the artificial intelligence is being used to evaluate. Okay. It also requires that an applicant can request destruction of the data that was collected in the interview process using the AI um, upon request. So Illinois, Illinois kind of set the stage, but now we have several additional pieces of legislation. So we have draft legislation, legislation in Maryland that prohibits the use of uh, AI tools that use facial recognition without applicant consent. Both houses of the legislature passed that pre-pandemic. We'll see what happens there. Both California and New York, are con New York City, sorry, are considering legislation that would restrict the sale and use of employment-related artificial intelligence. California's proposed law is really aimed at addressing discrimination concerns and would create a presumption that an employer's decision to hire or promote um, that incorporates assessment technology, AI, okay, is not discriminatory if it meets a few criteria. First, prior to deployment, if they tested the technology and found that it is not likely to have an adverse impact on hiring based on gender, race, or ethnicity. Second, that there's annual review of the outcomes to verify that there have been no adverse hiring practices based on use of the technology, or whether there's actually been improvement in diversity in the workplace. And thirdly, if there, that assessment reveals uh, post-deployment that there has been an adverse impact, that um, uh, the individual company will discontinue use. So that's California. New York is controlling whether you can sell AI tools that automate employment decisions, um, and they're requiring an audit to determine that there is no bias um, prior to purchase, and then annual audits thereafter to verify that AI has not introduced bias into the hiring process. Um, in, in the New York City legislation, 
employers will be required to notify candidates um, that AI was being used to assess their candidacy and to provide notice about the specific job qualifications and characteristics that were being assessed by the AI technology. So again, post-COVID, introducing new technologies into the hiring scenario, um, worried about bias that is introduced through the use of those technologies. So that's kind of tailing off on the employment piece. On, on this next piece, company look, companies are looking for more ways to offer existing uh, customers new services. COVID is by definition going to accelerate the pace of innovation. Some businesses have been caught flat-footed without a digital strategy, um, and so they're playing catch-up. So they're going to be using data, IP, and technology to underpin those efforts. Even before COVID, uh, businesses were feeling the pressure of technology disruption, whether direct by technology-rich competitors entering the marketplace, think ride-sharing versus taxicab services, or indirect disruption, think safe, safer autonomous vehicle disrupting the market for auto repair services, indirect disruption there. Way back in 2018, 2018, McKinsey did a survey and found that 92% of companies believe that digitization would threaten the survival of their business models. In that same survey in 2018, they found only 10% of companies were using their data to which they had access. Fast forward to 2020, and we're now seeing the greatest indirect disruptor that this country has seen in 100 years, COVID. <laughs> it either is going to accelerate the pivot potential of a business, or it's going to accelerate their exit. So from a transactional perspective, our clients who are trying to pivot are asking us to do a couple things. First, asking us to assist them in establishing new business relationships where they're partnering with nimble, technology-rich solution providers, while at the same time, preserving their rights to data usage and cultivation resulting from the partnership. Licensing and ownership of technology is particularly important, as well as control of data at all levels. Personal, the identified, aggregate, that's a heavily negotiated deal point. Who controls the data and who has the ability to cultivate relationships and further opportunities based on that data. And second, there's this request for us to assist off, uh, clients in offering new services to existing customers, services that have not been core to their business. And so this is really different. For decades, we've talked about staying with your core business, shed all the rest, stay with your core. And now in this new digital space, we're seeing this emphasis towards maybe bringing in some non-core businesses to tee up additional revenue streams. So business leaders and in-house counsel are now having to get a deeper understanding of cloud computing business models, of hyperscale cloud providers, and exposure and risk elements around data, data loss, and IP protection. So of putting together these sophisticated commercial deal structures really is required to have a very deep legal understanding of the interplay between IP and data and technology so that the agreements that we draft meet the needs of our clients and their business partners while protecting the personal information of consumers. And so I'll stop there. Um, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take one, Julon. I've got one uh, for you, okay. Jane. I mean, you know, the, yeah. you know, this urge and urgency to, to pivot, right? This notion that COVID is your best digital transformation uh, you know, consultant that you ever could have asked for. That's all sounds well and great. That's wonderful. It's possible to do it wrong. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it's possible to not think through what you need to be thinking through and, and pivot in a way and transform digitally in a way um, that will have longer term consequences than maybe you, you meant. Um, so can you tell us, uh, you know, some things that companies should be thinking through before they begin that pivot process, they begin that transformation process? That's, that's very interesting. So a couple things and then because uh, I know we need to, to keep moving on. First, it's important to recognize what you know and what you don't know. So we, a lot of times we talk about the, the, necessary, the necessity for the right skill set in the business. If you're moving into a space where you traditionally have no depth or expertise, your talent, the people on the team that are going to help you build out your new program are particularly important. Additionally, it's important for you to take good guidance from your advisors. Okay? And so often we've seen uh, companies that are transigent, know how they've done business previously, not recognizing that the way you did that 
is not the way that you tee up and stand up new digitally oriented businesses. So from a pure business perspective, those are the, some of the things that we see, but we also see a lack of familiarity with the rules of the road around IP, data, and technology that are critically important in order for those businesses to be successful. Obviously, making wrong bets, okay, is a, is a problem as well. But those kinds of two buckets of things, I'd say, at a high level, are things that folks need to be concerned about. Great, Janine, thanks. Um, and Chad, I think you're next. I think I'm next. Go yeah. to the next slide, great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how there are a number of companies that are thriving in the post-COVID world. So this is their moment. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a personal example of, of people that have been thriving in post-COVID. I have two teenage boys. And when they were told that um, you know, stay-at-home restrictions means, wait a minute, I have to be on screens all day long. I'm not allowed to go outside and do anything. Uh, you know, they're both video game heads. They both love their phones. They love, um, you know, YouTube. You know, they turn to us and like, no problem. We've been training for this all of our lives. We've got this, right? We've got this. Um, and this notion of a, of a touchless uh, society, the distance learning platform, uh, you know, pretty much anything that allows for, you know, we, obviously we, everybody's heard Zoom, but, you know, think about uh, telehealth. Think about distance learning platforms. Um, I'm seeing quite a number of clients um, taking the assets that they've spent years building up and really being able to leverage them and not just survive, but meet a need um, and uh, and and you know gain more market share and thrive um, in this environment. Um, it, it, you know, it's brought a lot of sort, and I'm also seeing clients that um, have thought of their data as assets for a fair amount of time um, and are able to leverage the information to be able to to pivot and react to the COVID world very quickly, very effectively. Um, you know, we're seeing clients in sort of the food industry. Ali talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the pivot that she saw in a um, you know, restaurant distribution being able to to move. We're, we are seeing clients in uh, in the retail space, uh, especially with food distribution, being able to leverage their data uh, to to you know reconfigure their supply chain and get wholesale food into the hands of consumers much quicker than some of their competitors because the data has been able to enable that. Um, in the distance learning space, we're seeing clients that uh, have taken content that they've created and are thinking of ways to uh, make that available to other schools, to other universities, to um, you know, enable them to be able to pivot to this new distance learning uh, moment that we're finding ourselves in. Um, and these have created some interesting IP challenges in, in coming up with these, uh, with these new agreements. Um, nobody knows where they're going to be five, 10 years from now. So everybody's trying to keep their options open, right? Everybody has sort of uh, taken to heart this notion that they need to uh, be able to digitally transform, to be agile, um, you know, to pivot and to be able to react. Um, so in your traditional IP licenses, where you try to restrict field of use, so I'm gonna allow you to access you know, my copyrights, you know, um, I'm going to license my patent to you, but I'm going to strictly define what uh, you can and can't do with it, what types of markets you can and can't enter, and slice and dice those markets very thin. There's a lot of resistance around that, right? Because the folks that are bringing this in, as they uh, pivot for the first time, as they uh, have new, you sort of expand their market footprint, um, they want to be able to take those learnings and, and continue with them. Um, so the push and the pull between the clients that have the leverage because they currently have the technology and the data and the the companies um, that uh, may not be similarly situated but still have market power still have bargaining power because of uh this you know the size that they can ingest um you know this licensed material there's a real um some really interesting negotiations i think going on in the ip licensing world and the same is very similar with reverse engineering restrictions um you know, there's a, a case out of the Seventh Circuit, uh, a SAS World Programming uh, case, where 
um, you know, the court um, enforced a reverse engineering contract restriction in a fashion that almost uh, felt like it created a new IP right. The court found uh, that the source code that was involved there, um, there was no copyright prohibition against reverse engineering it. The only uh, access to the code was to recreate functionality. Um, but nonetheless, there was a violation of a contract prohibition against reverse engineering and the uh, the award came back at eighty and eighty million dollar uh, liability for for breaching that reverse engineering. So figuring out what this scope and how to uh, expand or limit reverse engineering contractually is uh, is something that's been a, a bit of a hot area too. Um, another thing that I am seeing is that uh, open innovation is having its moments. Um, you know the open COVID uh, pledge. Uh, there are many many heavy hitters: Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, you know, Verizon and others that are uh, allowing their patents to be used royalty free um, until uh, the, the term is one year after the WHO has uh, announced the pandemic is over. Um, the, the licenses are beautiful. Uh, they're very short. They're very clear. They're very clean. But by definition, that means they leave a good bit of ambiguity as to what comes next. Um, you know, when that license expires, um, you know, do you now have to take your products off the market? Um, you know, if you used it to come up with a vaccine and you're able to use your um, base uh, vaccine or your base test kit and make derivative works off of that, do you now um, need to pull those uh, products off the market or negotiate a paid license? What, what happens next? Um, Creative Commons has been a, a godsend um, in being able to enable people to share data, but um, you know, uh, Creative Commons licenses are irrevocable, right? So once you donate that or once you uh, make that available via Creative Commons, you can't unring that bell. So thinking through three, four, five years from now, what happens in the post-COVID world, how does this fit into your overall business plan um, is tremendously uh, important. Um, and this is nothing new. A lot of companies have already been embracing open innovation um, strategies and needing to thread it into their need to make money, um, but recognizing that um, building a groundswell of innovation through through open innovation policies uh, yields to the bottom line, actually helps the bottom line. Um, oh, and we're also seeing a lot of grassroots uh, data sharing. I mean, it, there, there's just something um, visceral. I, I don't know if you all, uh, you know, all have friends that are in the healthcare space, whether folks working on vaccine, uh, doctors on the, um, you know, on the front lines, but I'm just hearing anecdotally, um, you know, that there's a lot of information sharing that ER docs in the United States are talking to ER docs in Italy, uh, you know, talking to uh, ER docs in, in China and sharing insights, you know, sharing uh, treatment techniques, what does and doesn't work. So things that, you know, folks may want to, you know, they're held on to and make sure they have proper attribution and publish on, um, a lot of those concerns have dropped. There's a lot of just free flow of information, um, which is uh, is reassuring. And I think we're, again, seeing that that groundswell come into more formal ways at the level of industry, the level of business, um, the level of, of more formal open innovation strategies. Um, and then we're also seeing a, uh, a cert, or, you know, a, 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 um, that things like 3D printing are, are having their moment as well. The technologies that enable pivoting, right? Technologies that enable you to um, move from, um, you know, manufacturing plastics to manufacturing face masks, uh, from manufacturing, um, you know, automobiles to manufacturing ventilators. Um, there's a great blog post, a bit of a plug, one of my colleagues, Aaron Rabinowitz, uh, highly recommend that you read it, but he did a great job of sort of summarizing um, the ways that 3D printing technologies have been deployed um, in this uh, in this COVID world, um, but that has IP issues with it too, right? Um, you know there are uh, trade secret, um, you know potential patents, copyright protections around some of those the the 3D printing designs. Uh, you know folks are sharing those things sometimes heedless as to whether or not there's IP involved, heedless both in the ingestion. Oh, I found this, therefore I can use it without really doing any kind of clearance um, and heedlessness in terms of the making it available, right? That uh, it may make sense right now um, to make these designs available to allow others to 
um, address this concern. But again, thinking about, well, okay, you know, these are bells that can't be unrung. If you gave up a trade secret to respond to COVID, you're not going to be able to claw it back. Um, and uh, you know, be able to leverage that and, and monetize it in some fashion. Um, you may be, may be okay with that. It'd be a trade-off, right? Um, you, you get that notoriety, you get that adoption, um, but think it through. It needs to be thought through. It needs to be part of a an overall uh, IP uh, business uh, digital transformation type strategy. Um, Chad, I, we have a question from the audience, and I think sure. uh, this is actually a really good segue. Um, uh, the question is, distance learning may not be profitable for traditional educational institutions. So you're, the mo notion that there's a lot of free content and maybe there's some kind of make-do kind of options that have been provided you know, during COVID, is there, uh, do you think you know, a lot of those kinds of changes and maybe the pivots, as, as Janine was talking about, are they sustainable from a profit perspective? Are these kind of you know, patching in a, in a short term or is this really kind of a change? And maybe it's different from you know, one industry into another, but the question here is that it, it's probably not profitable for the traditional educational setting. It, it is not profitable in the short term, absolutely. I mean, universities are, are uh, in, un, under terrible, dire straits right now. Um, but there have been a number of top shelf universities that have already sort of begun uh, integrating distance learning um, into their overall curriculum. Um, so one of our clients is a company called 2U. Uh, 2U does work with, with Harvard, with Georgetown, with other top universities. Um, and you know, there's been a sort of recognition that consumer preferences may begin to change and pivot towards a digital footprint um, in the future anyway. Um, they were sort of poised to be able to handle this. Other universities are gonna be forced to think through this. So I think uh, these are strains that the universities were going to feel organically, ev evolutionarily anyway, um, but not as intensely as we're seeing it now. And, um, and I don't think anybody foresees a future in which, um, you know, there's never on campus learning again. Um, you know, there are never dormitories again. There's, you know, you're going to completely replace that college experience. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, realizing that, you um, you know, your business plan is, is going to change a bit that, you know, integration of distance learning into your on-campus learning footprint um, is necessary. And as Ali pointed out, uh, you know, your, your, your best consultant just told you that, right? COVID-19 just that made that super clear to you. Yeah, maybe that's a good segue to the next slide. Um, so, so what are the companies doing? And I, I think the what what all of us are asking is what is the new normal? You know, what are the trends that are going to that are here to stay? Uh, what is the new environment that we're going to be operating in, where we have to make changes? Whether that is in restructuring, or maybe that is acquiring companies, or maybe it's exiting an industry, maybe it is uh, laying off a, a business unit that is no longer serving this new need um, anymore. Or if it's, if it's accelerating, as Chad was talking about, you know, if this was the future anyways, you know, this is the moment now. And a lot of the questions that we're getting from our clients is it does tend to be data focused. I mean, um, making those decisions, whether you want to pivot, accelerate or exit, that by itself takes data. So uh, we have been really kind of, you know, helping our clients grapple with making these decisions um, and, and making them quickly. So we were kind of taking a look at the different kinds of uh, businesses and industries that might be in a different uh, road and a different path uh, to, to where uh, they might be heading um, in this new environment. There, there are companies that are collecting new and unique data sets during COVID and will continue to collect new and unique data sets post COVID. And so if you're in that um, camp where you have never collected this type of data before, and you are because you have launched a new product or you have gone into a new service, you have found innovation during this challenging time, and you have kind of struck a chord. You know, maybe you, this is the moment for you to shine, as Chad was saying. And um, all of a sudden, you are um, you're in possession of a new and unique value propositions that your data set has. Um, what are the kinds of IP uh, rights that you need to think about in advance, as Chad was talking about? And how do you structure the, the, the corporation and some of the, 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 the transactional elements 
of collecting the data and sharing the data in, in a corporate sense, as Janine was talking about. If the current uh, status is not working, and let's say you're not accelerating, uh, and you are thinking about either being acquired by another player, or you're, you're the target company, or you are in the, in the mode of buying, um, as, as we know that there are some companies that are looking to buy, you know, whether it's buying distressed companies or buying for strategic you know, uh, reasons, a lot of M&A and restructuring issues are coming to play. And um, I think, um, you know, just the same way that Chad was talking about how every company is now becoming a technology company, I think the same thing can be said about every company becoming a data company in some sense. And a lot of the M&A and restructuring decisions seems to be really placing a high uh, premium on the data uh, that the target company holds. So whether you are in, in selling mode and you are looking to get acquired, you're looking for more funding, you're trying to raise capital, or uh, you're looking to exit. What are the kinds of data assets and IP assets that, that you want to identify at the company level? And how do you really kind of identify the, the vulnerabilities, but also the opportunities that come with that? Data monetization, I think is, is sometimes a dirty word. And you know, not a lot of companies like to say, okay, we're monetizing data. In fact, if you take a look at the hundreds of companies that have raised their hand uh, in California to say, I'm a data broker, um, you'll see that a couple of companies are, are very you know, conspicuously missing. So some companies that have been uh, you know, perhaps uh, in the business of, of collecting and using and transferring data, they are saying they're not data brokers. And um, you know, there is definitely a, a huge emphasis placed by the California AG, the Attorney General, and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and many non-US regulators in terms of who is in the business of buying and selling data. And should the regulators and US and, and uh, non-US governments regulate the practice of buying and selling data? So this is definitely a hot topic. And for companies that have raised their hand saying, okay, I am a data broker and I'm complying with the data broker laws, uh, you are in one bucket. And uh, but, you know, there are lots of other companies that from a public perception perspective uh, could be seen as buying and selling data, but uh, may not have really come to a determination that you are selling data. So how do you navigate uh, when a company becomes uh, to make the decision that you're going to be monetizing data. And I think the conversation in terms of the CCPA and FTC, it really is focused on personal data, personally identifiable data, meaning uh, data that identifies a natural human being. But we are seeing that there is a, a fair amount of data monetization happening that has nothing to do with personal data. So we wanted to mention that as well. Um, as, as Chad and Janine were saying, um, there are many companies that are looking at data analytics for operational purposes, for efficiency, to boost productivity, to do better inventory management, just to have better analytics. So if you are looking for quality data, trusted data and to have data integrity so that you are creating better products and better service delivery, then you need data. And that is outside of the personal data regulations, that is outside of the privacy laws, but still IP rights and transactional um, and corporate issues still come into play, as well as a, uh, antitrust and some of the other legal issues that we see happening um, as this complex data challenges are, are worked with, uh, with, our, with our clients. Uh, fourth, we wanted to mention uh, the role that AI machine learning and, and data analytics play. Um, I think it's definitely a buzzword. You know, everyone likes to say that we're using AI. Uh, there are lots of products that, that say that uh, we're using AI, and there's also a lot of naysayers saying uh, that AI is really not AI, uh, that it is just, just kind of you know, smarter technology. So uh, ha having said that, you know, I think we are probably um, of the mindset that uh, this, this emerging technology and the use of automation, the use of profiling and, and inferences is here to stay. And the sophistication of these uh, new, new and emerging technologies is only going to increase. 
in the adoption of these technologies in things like hiring, you know, Ali was talking about, uh, you know, the use of, you know, virtual reality and, and being able to work remotely, as, as Richard was talking about. Those kinds of technology evolutions are going to fuel uh, the need for more data. So if you need more data, because AI doesn't work with what small data sets, um, AI only works in big data, how do you make sure that you have quality data? How do you make sure that you have the right to that data, uh, which is where, where, what Chad was talking about? And how can you structure the relationship with your third parties, with your vendors, and with your customers so that you can use it and you can transfer it the way that you envision in your new normal? So those are the kinds of four things, um, the kind of trends that we see in this world of data economy. Um, and I wanted to uh, see if you had any questions. So, Juwan, this is Janine. Well, you can see me. This is Janine. So, um, I know the new data broker laws are coming online in Vermont and California, and the CCPA is going to be beginning to be enforced on July 1. What are some concrete things companies can do now to understand and mitigate the privacy risks while maximizing the opportunity around the data economy? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the, the point of your question, Janine, is, is now, right? So July 1 is just around the corner. That's 60 days away. So if, if your company has, has published the public uh, a privacy notice on January 1, um, that notice is here to stay. You have made your public disclosures on whether you are selling data or you're not. You know, you have already kind of you know, put a stake in the ground saying, here is our company position. Um, so between now and July, it really is a, as a way to, it, you know, the company should be really looking inward to say, okay, here is the public promise that we made, and we said that we do or we do not sell data, and here are the sources of our data. Here's where we collect it from, so all the third-party categories. Here is how we use the data, um, the uses and the purposes for which the data has been collected should have been included in those disclosures, and to whom you're transferring it the categories of third parties to whom the data is transferred, those are all disclosure requirements that are in uh, the privacy policy as of January 1. So between the next, you know, in the next 60 days, what you should be doing is to really kind of vet it, to, to verify that those disclosures that were made on January 1 um, is true and accurate and comprehensive. And that if there is litigation, if there is a third party claim, if there's a regulatory inquiry, then you can defend those positions. So we're seeing a lot of uh, companies that are doing internal audits, whether it's using a third party um, consultant like us, or it's internal audit and risk offices uh, to test it, to test that the compliance program and the risk management controls and governance programs that you have put in place are working. And as Ali was saying, um, you know, the role of the board has, has really increased in this area. So we're seeing that the board is asking these questions. So you know, not just you know, it's just letting the chief privacy officer or the CISO to put together these programs, but the board is saying, come and do a presentation and let us know that we are ready for July one. And that's you know specifically for California. What about for companies that are perhaps not operating in California? What do we look out for? You know, there are over 15 other states that have proposed and are considering similar laws like California. Washington is one of them, and obviously we're watching that closely along with New York and some of the other uh, major states uh, where, where they have a stake um, in really kind of thinking about privacy governance and, and rights um, in this new era. Um, but that's not all. Um, you know, we already have, outside of the consumer privacy laws that we have been focused on, there are laws that apply to IoT security. There are laws that apply to financial data, healthcare data, children's data. Um, you name it. Uh, it's really a fragmented uh, landscape. So I think it's understanding that um, in the COVID world, in this challenging time, if you have dipped your toe into an area that your business is not, not traditionally operated in. So let's say, um, I think one of the examples was with a restaurant business that is now uh, doing direct-to-consumer delivery or, or a manufacturing company that's looking at creating a software. So what that means is you are now in a jurisdiction and you're in a regulatory landscape that your team, internal team, does not have the expertise to operate in. So you might be under different regulation, regulations and different legal requirements, especially on the handling of data. 
And because the definition of personal information is so broad under CCPA, things like cookies and the use of online advertising and, and tracking your know, human behavior on your website, that could be personal information. So it, it's understanding you know, what changed, you know, what are some business changes that you're making uh, you know, in the world of COVID and, and post. And uh, are there some new legal and regulatory uh, compliance requirements that, that come to play and prioritizing what you need to do now? Uh, because I, I understand uh, that the budget is limited and you are not going to be able to solve every problem. But knowing uh, you know, what are the high priority strategic decisions that you need to do to protect your assets and to be able to maximize it you know, to its fullest potential. So that's good. And I know we're wrapping up. Um, I, I think it's important that as we weave these things together, it's important that we talk about, you know, it's important to have a strategic and ecosystem level view of these issues. Um, because there are issues around data that you've talked about, technology that I've talked about, IP that, that, that Chad has talked about, that requires us to not be myopic and think at a single deal level, but really have a, an elevated view of the entire ecosystem around this change. Um, because you can create supply chain gaps, you can create regulatory gaps, you can create missed opportunities to protect IP um, if we're thinking, our clients are thinking of these on a one-off basis. So this notion of ecosystem level perspective um, around some of these issues is the best way to not miss things along the way and to um, increase your likelihood for success. Um, let's go. I have a question here from the audience and um, I think that's a it's a good question to kind of uh, to tie up um, our conversation. So let me uh, try to address it. Uh, when we talk about monetization of data, is that just selling the data or is it more than that? Is it leveraging the data that you have to accelerate a new component of your business that you are pivoting? And I think that's really hitting on, on all of our presentations so far. So I'll take the monetization mm -hmm. part, but I want to hear from, from all of the panelists and, and perhaps um, you know, one minute each for closing remarks. Um, so on the monetization, absolutely. Um, you know, when we begin kind of data monetization and, and really data use policy, um, you know, and data mapping, it starts from identification of data assets, knowing what you have and how it's collected and why you're using it. it we are thinking about first internal customers and then two external customers. So absolutely, there are many data monetization and data utilization strategies that have nothing to do with sharing data to third parties and selling it um, in terms of selling consumer data, you know, which is kind of what is talked about in the media. Um, but um, I'll have the other panelists speak to the, the pivoting part and perhaps using the data to accelerate those, uh, those new components. Chad, you wanna? Sure. So from an accelerate perspective, um, you know, once a week I have a call from a, a firm client. Uh, I, I have all this valuable data. I own it, right? Um, and what can I do with it? And I have to break open what they've been doing with the data, how they've been collecting it, and go through these notions of ownership. And there's, you know, it's really twofold. One is an IP perspective, mostly copyright, right? Mostly um, data, uh, databases, copyright ownership around schemas, copyright ownership around databases, around the software that manages the data, and then also trade secret protection. You know, not just, oh, we've got it dumped in a data lake, but what are, um, you know, the algorithms that get applied to that data lake? What are the techniques uh, for data normalization? What are the techniques for extracting and porting the data from point A to point B? Some of that can also involve patents. Um, so, you know, data is a driver of a lot of IP innovations. Uh, and they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, your data set's going to be worth more if your IP is built up around it. Your IP is going to be worth more um, if you've got robust data that needs to be managed um, in a certain fashion. And that is going to be a launching off platform on this notion of, of accelerating. And, and uh, we're seeing a lot of clients doing this at a breakneck speed because they finally realize, oh, this is an operation, you know, this is an asset that I can operationalize. I think that's right. And the coming together of these notions around data and IP, which is really kind of this creation of technology to solve problems or to move businesses forward, is really the combination of these concepts. And so um, as we move to the next slide, because I know we're, we're right at one o'clock, um, I know we need to, um, I think there's another slide, but 
the, the next seminar that we're going to have is, is next week, and we're going to talk about this very issue, how companies can pivot and transform their digital assets into alternative revenue streams. And we're going to have two panelists there. Uh, one panelist is going to talk about it's a small business that has done the pivot because COVID has forced them to pivot to survive. And they've gone from surviving to thriving in ways they never anticipated pre-COVID. And second is a client that um, we're seeing tons of missed opportunity around IP, around innovation, around data um, prior to COVID and has been looking at ways to deliver additional and enhanced value to its client set in light of what those opportunities might be if they packaged the technology, IP, and data in a meaningful way. So we'll talk about that next week and we hope you'll join us. Then following on for part three of our talk um, on the 20th, um, we're talking about how some companies have accelerated in the COVID environment rather than retreating by leveraging the digital technologies and assets, data assets that they've already accumulated. And the final part of our four-part series deals with the exit, how to navigate your exit. For those who are thinking about bankruptcy, this is not all about bankruptcy. This is about restructuring. This is about reorging. This is about employment and labor issues and antitrust issues and how you handle distressed assets. Um, from a privacy and cybersecurity and other perspectives. Um, so we are out of time um, and we appreciate everyone's attention. That's the second code I thought we were looking for. There you go. And with that, I think we bid you good afternoon. Or good morning in on Pacific Coast. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.